the Pope wanted to baptize the first alien. American geologist John Wesley Powell led a scientific trip in the state of Wyoming in August 1869. Powell had learned on his own. During the process, he had no idea that his team would find the Great Unconformity, a huge gap in the Earth's natural history. Powell looked up at one of the cliffs and saw that the solid crystalline rocks were not stacked in the normal horizontal layers, but almost vertically. It looked like someone had taken a piece of Earth and stacked the rest of it like nothing had happened. It turned out that the rock just above the layers below was about 80 million years younger than the rock above them, which was up to 425 million years old. That was it. There was nothing else. Dark secrets of the Vatican, hidden for thousands of years, revealed. Scientists today aren't sure where this event came from, but most of them think it happened during the marine glaciation. Over this time, the Earth's surface got a thick layer of ice, and then new rocks formed on top of it. But when the glaciers melted, they erased a large part of the geological past. This isn't an isolated case. Many times, problems with time can't even be described. It might not seem very important if the problem was just with the Wyoming hills. But it's hard to stay neutral when all of human history is suddenly in danger of not making sense. You'll learn the following in this video. Where did 300 years of the Middle Ages go? For more than a thousand years, how did the Vatican make up parts of our history? Could there have been a nuclear war a long time ago that we don't know about? What problems with the order of events make the accepted history of humanity seem less certain? Researchers are still not sure of the exact start and end dates of the Middle Ages. There are historians who aren't even sure that about half of this time period was real. Herbert Illig, a German historian, found an old plot in 1991 that could have changed all of human history. Not long after the year 1000, the Holy Roman Emperor Otto III chose to take back control of Italy. A few hundred years before that, those lands had been taken over by the Lombards, an old Germanic people. Bishop Gerber of Aurillac, who was born in France, offered to help Otto III. In the end, the Emperor got what he wanted and thanked his friend for helping by letting him become Pope Sylvester Sassentu. What was that great favor that the ruler felt he had to repay. When the lands were taken back, Otto III said he had a close connection to the Carolingian line, which ruled over large parts of Europe from the 7th century AD to the 9th. People now think that this ruling, family and especially one of its members, Charlemagne or Charles the Great, had a big impact on what happened in the Middle Ages. That person was Charlemagne. He brought together many different groups into one state, which became known as the Frankish Empire, even though Herbert Illig says that Otto III made up the Carolingians by adding 300 years to history, and Pope Sylvester II supported the idea, Otto III claimed that he was only trying to make history fair. After this idea seemed crazy at first, scientists didn't believe it, but later, strong evidence started to support it. For a long time, archaeologists have noticed that there aren't many artifacts from the 7th century AD to the 10th century AD. We've already found hundreds of artifacts from times before and after the Carolingian era. However, not many things were made during that time, and experts are still not sure if they can correctly guess their age. Also, academics still haven't come up with a good reason why Western Europe has so many buildings that look incredibly old. This is the Church of San Sisto in the city of Pisa in Italy. It is thought to have been built in the early 1100s. Even so, the front of it looks more like buildings from before the Roman Empire or buildings that were built in Europe 300 years ago. Different kinds of architecture tend to come and go pretty quickly. To give you an example, the so-called flamboyant phase of late Gothic construction 
is similar to early Gothic buildings. Keep in mind that this big change happened in just 100 years. So why does it look like buildings stopped changing altogether at the start of the Middle Ages? It's too bad that even solid historical proof can't help us figure this out. In 1986, people at an archaeological conference in Munich, Germany, found that more than half of the papers from the Middle Ages were fakes. To be exact, the decretals of Pseudo Isidore, a collection of works that praised Roman bishops. Even though it was said to have been written in the 6th century, scientists found colors that couldn't have been used before the 9th century AD. And what if all the things we learned in school about the Middle Ages were false? Don't throw your history books out the window just yet, because the only proof for Herbert Illig's idea is, at best, vague. It's possible that the papers were just changed a long time after they were made. After all, this happened a lot to texts in the Middle Ages. For historical finds from the time of the Carolingians, maybe their time will come in the future. Also, the idea of a phantom Middle Ages in Europe doesn't fit well with the past of the rest of the world. China did very well during the Tang Dynasty, which ruled from the 7th century to the 10th. The Tang Dynasty cared a lot about the country's culture and economic growth. It was also during that time that China's borders were greatly stretched, so we can't just erase it from history. But Herbert Illig's theory wasn't perfect. He was able to show the experts a number of other problems with it, which led them to doubt the authenticity of many artifacts and papers. Some of them were much more important than 300 years. The Vatican has a bad reputation for trying to change the truth, but there is one case that may have had an effect on the whole of Europe for 1,500 years. At the beginning of the 4th century, the Eastern Roman Empire was more prosperous than ever before. Emperor Constantine the Great was the first leader to make Christianity the official religion of the country. Even though the ruler was working towards a good goal, he still got leprosy. Doctors couldn't do anything, and the lives of thousands of Christians were in danger. However, a miracle took place, and it was all because of Pope Sylvester I. It was said that his prayers healed Emperor Constantine, even though he was already dead. And it's possible that your country's healthcare costs are too high. However, Constantine was so thankful to Sylvester I that he gave up his power and large lands to the Pope. But Sylvester wasn't ready for that much responsibility, so he gave back the power. At some point in the 800s, Pope Stephen II told this story to Pepin the Short, King of the Franks. The Pope even backed up what he said with the donation of Constantine, a document that says the same thing. Stephen II wanted to take back lands that Pepin the Short had just taken over with its help. The Pope said that all the lands mentioned in the decree still belong to the church because Sylvester uh, I hadn't publicly said he wouldn't accept the gift. Because Pepin the Short couldn't read, he couldn't make a case because he didn't know what the paper said. He had to follow Stephen the Coup because of this. If he could have read that text quickly, he might have been shocked by some of the lines that let the Pope make the king be his groom. These wildly imaginative points were there for one simple reason. The paper was a fake. But that didn't stop the church from using the fake order for hundreds of years afterward, sometimes taking over the land. Over time, the Vatican took over a large part of central Italy. This included parts of Emilia-Romagna, Umbria, Lazio, and Marsh, as well as Rome and the areas around it. In the late 1600s, Cardinal Caesar Baronius saw that the donation of Constantine was not what it seemed to be and tried to talk about it. He was quickly shut down. It may sound crazy, but the church finally admitted in 1929 that it had been using fake paper for 1500. Years to change the plan of Europe to suit its needs. This came after a lot of public pressure. Anyway, the Vatican had to give back all the land it had stolen, and now it only takes up a little over half a square kilometer. That being said, what if the donation of a Constantine is only the beginning? 
the secret apostolic archive is still kept in Vatican City and is hard to get to. No one will be able to get in, not even a reporter for one of the biggest news outlets in the world, or a student writing a thesis on the history of the Catholic Church. Scientists who are at least 75 years old are the only strangers who can try their luck. Also, each student can only take three of the suggested articles. If they want to read more, they have to go through the whole process of getting an entry card all over again. There may be written proof in the secret database of what really happened in the Middle Ages, from the 7th century to the 10th. The well-kept secret might not be just the past of a certain time, though. It might be a full-on nuclear war. Could one of the ancient civilizations have had guns that were very different from what we think of as weapons today? In 1829, Charles Masson found the ruins of an old city called Harappa while traveling through what is now Pakistan. Archaeological digs showed that the first people lived there in the 4th millennium BC. For experts, the fact that all of Harappa's streets were built in the same way, from north to south and west to east, was even more surprising than how old the stones were. Not only was it done for looks sake, it also gave people access to running water a very long time ago. The people who lived in Harappa had more than just toilets, they also had swimming pools. Also, experts found that the city's main square used to have a public bathhouse. The floors and outside walls were sealed with resin to keep water out. Remember that this is about a time before the Egyptian temples, when people could only build huts out of mud and straw that would last for a long time. Archaeologists were surprised by all of these things that the Indus Valley Civilization, which is one of the most mysterious and least studied in history, had done. Who were these people who were so far ahead of their time? Why do we not know much about them? Could the people of this ancient society have known things that some people in our own time are still trying to keep from us? The Indus Society ended all of a sudden in 1300 BC. Scientists have been trying to figure out for a long time what could have ended such a highly developed society. Some of them thought it was a natural accident, while others thought those smart people had just run out of useful things to use. Then, in 1977, researcher David Davenport found something that showed that none of these ideas were true. He saw a 50-meter wide hole while working at a dig site. All of the rocks inside melted and turned into something that looked like glass. That kind of thing could only happen at temperatures of at least 1,500 degrees Celsius. It looked a lot like what would happen after an explosion as strong as an atomic bomb. Even stranger, more research only supported this crazy idea when excavators discovered a layer of radioactive cinder close to the dig site. Also, the radiation background of some of the remnants was 50 times higher than usual, according to scientists. Does this mean that nations at war with each other used nuclear bombs against each other a few thousand years ago? In the old Indian epic, the Mahabharata, there are stories about a huge explosion that could burn whole communities to ashes and be as bright as 10,000 suns. In great depth, it also talks about what happened after these kinds of explosions. People who lived lost their hair and skin, and the food and soil became contaminated. But what if this isn't just a scary story about the god's weapon? What if it's a short account of real events? And if people from long ago knew how to make atomic bombs, what else could they have learned? A lot of Indus ceramic plates with strange writing on them have been found up to this point. From what I can tell, these old people had a lot of education. Some experts think that the tablets wrote about all of the most important inventions that the Indus society made. The only problem is that we still can't figure out what they say. The only thing experts know for sure is that those people wrote their language from right to left. There isn't much there, is there? But could there be someone who read the tablets but chose not to tell anyone because the truth was too shocking and went against everything we know about human history? 
Who knows, maybe those artifacts don't just talk about nuclear weapons. They might talk about something else, like a lost land that not many people today know about. Could we have totally missed the fact that there was a real continent? In 1642, Dutch sailor Abel Tasman set out on a risky trip with a goal that seemed silly at the time, to find the seventh continent. Toscano was motivated by a very simple thought. The Southern Hemisphere had to have a huge area to balance out Eurasia, which was in the northern part of the world. The sailor thought that Australia, which had just been found, was way too small to play such an important role. During his trip, he looked at the map that sailor Piri Race made in 1513 a lot of the time. The map showed a huge region that looked a lot like Antarctica. In fact, Europeans didn't find it until 1820, which is a long time later. Race said that he had copied the picture from an old book that had been saved from the Library of Alexandria, which had already been burned. Another strange thing about the map was that it showed a small isthmus linking an unknown continent to South America. Some modern experts think that sticking out a piece of land might only be a part of the continent and that the people who mapped it got it wrong. But since maps were so important and many sailors' lives depended on them, why didn't anyone throw away that risky drawing? Instead, they kept it. As it turned out, Abel Tasman never did find the lost continent. In the Pacific Ocean, the sailor found a few islands but he didn't even dare land on them because the native people were dangerous. We now call those islands New Zealand, but back then, they were not even close to being a new continent. A group of geologists from around the world went on a trip to the coast of New Caledonia in 2017. They came across an interesting fact while looking into the features of the ocean floor in the area. The samples from the seabed had pollen from plants that grow on land and the remains of primitive animals that couldn't live in deep water. Also, there was a lot of slate in the samples, which is a sedimentary rock that doesn't fit on the ocean floor. There were lots of signs that this land used to be dry a long time ago. But was it really the lost continent? Geologists compared what they had found to a thorough analysis of satellite data and came to a shocking conclusion. Around 25 million years ago, there really was an extra continent on Earth. It was named Zealandia. If it turns out that Abel Tasman was right, he would be very surprised. Under the two-kilometer-thick sea, you can still see the shapes of the old continent. But why aren't experts telling everyone about Zealandia right away? Because not even their smartest people can figure out how a continent got flooded. They don't want to make hasty decisions that could change the course of events. Perhaps the answer lies in the so-called Eye of the Sahara, a rock formation on the other side of the world. It was found in 1965 by American scientists. This structure is made up of many concentric rings of exposed sedimentary rock and is almost symmetrical. There are different opinions among experts about what might have caused this strange event, but one thing is certain, this part of the country was underwater about 12,000 years ago. Researchers looked at the uncovered rock surface and found layers of old sea salt. Also, the so-called cataclysmic period happened on Earth between 13,000 and 11,000. Years ago, all over the world there were tornadoes, earthquakes and tsunamis, which probably flooded the Sahara Desert. It's also not clear why large areas of dry land in the Pacific Ocean went underwater and never came back to the surface, as well as the fact that Easter Island, with its famous giant heads, is not far away. It's been a puzzle to archaeologists for a long time. Who built those huge statues on such a small island, and why would they do it? But if we think that it was once a mountaintop on the land of the long-gone country Zealandia, we see a typical religious site and pilgrimage site built by a mysterious ancient society. Its members could have been the powerful enemies of the Indus society who used nuclear weapons to wipe it out. For now, 
all of these strange discrepancies found on maps and in records of the past are just waiting for someone to explain them. But historians who are looking for mistakes in the past can get carried away sometimes. For example, Anatoly Fomenko, a Russian scientist, puts a question mark over 1,600 years of human history. He said that Vladimir the Great, who was the Grand Prince of Kiev, was actually a ruler of Rome. This would mean that Jesus Christ lived in the 1400s. Because of this, the truth was kept from us all by lying about every historical record. Compared to this, the Vatican crimes look like silly things that kids do. When pointing out mistakes in history, it may be most important to know when to stop and not cause even more trouble.